Okay, so my name is Andy Brakespear. I'm a research assistant here at the John Innes Centre. And I think one of the things I, that excites me most about science is the ability to use it to try and solve real-life problems. And I'm going to give an example of one of those problems um, that we're trying to solve in the lab, and that relates to engineering nitrogen-fixing cereals. Okay, so the aims of today's talk is that to start with, I'm going to introduce a problem, and that relates to nitrogen. It's a very serious problem. I'm then going to show how we're looking to science to solve this problem, and we're going to be looking at uh, a symbiosis, a legume rhizobium symbiosis. And then going to conclude by looking at the applications and implications of what we're doing. So first of all, uh, the, the problem. So I think nitrogen actually gets really neglected. But the thing is, it's crucial to all of us. It's in every single one of our cells. It's in every single cell in this deer, and it's in every single cell in this maize plant. And that's because it's a, a, an essential part of proteins, amongst other things. Now, we're actually in a, a really bizarre situation that we're surrounded by nitrogen. It's everywhere in our atmosphere. It's something like 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. But the problem is, is we can breathe this nitrogen in, but we can't do anything with it. We just breathe it out again. And the same is true for this deer, and something similar is also true for, for this maize plant. And the, the problem is, is that atmospheric nitrogen contains a very strong triple bond. It can, takes a lot of energy to break this uh, and use the, the nitrogen um, in our proteins. So what we can do is eat something like this deer, take its proteins and recycle them, and use the nitrogen in those proteins to make our own proteins. Or we could eat this maize plant also. And what this deer can do is, is eat this maize plant and use the nitrogen contained um, within the maize proteins. But of course you can see it's a little bit more difficult for this maize to take a nibble out of this deer. So it actually relies on rare events such as lightning to provide the energy to break this N triple bond N and convert atmospheric nitrogen to nitrate in the soil. So it does happen, but it's not very often. This nitrate, then, can be taken up by the roots of the, of the plant and used to make protein. But the problem is, is that this nitrate is uh, easily dissolved in water. Okay, so it gets converted from atmospheric nitrogen by lightning into nitrate, but then can very quickly get dissolved, and it finds itself coming out of the soil and into water bodies. So there is a source of nitrate there in the soil for the plant to use, but it's very unreliable. So for a farmer, they want to get the maximum yields they can out their crop. And so they do this typically using fertilizer, and this is a, a happy plant that's been treated with some fertilizer. If we remove that fertilizer, you can see that we really neglect the plant and uh, it's not able uh, to grow. So fertilizer, um, or its production, was discovered back in, in 1913, and this combines atmospheric nitrogen with hydrogen. And this uses very high temperatures, very high pressures, to force this reaction to ammonia. The ammonia is then used to make nitrate, and that's what we find in nitrate-based fertilizer. So this was a huge discovery for the time. The thing is, as I said earlier, it needs tons of pressure and tons of temperature to get this. And the energy required for this is something like 2% of the entire energy we produce each year. And that might not seem like a lot, but if we compare that to cans of Red Bull, we're looking at about 100 trillion cans of Red Bull goes per year into producing um, the nitrate to use in fertilizer. So it's a load of energy. 
This is a, a map of the world um, back in 1860, uh, looking at nitrogen deposition. And you can see that this is a scale, and uh, the, the white here relates to a very low amount, and the purple is a very high amount. Now, after the introduction of fertilizer, you can see we're starting to get these obvious hot spots uh, where farmers are using the fertilizer and the nitrate um, is coming up in the soil very clearly here, very high levels. If we continue to use fertilizers we're doing at the moment, then in 2050, the map will look something like this. Now, the thing is, is of that fertilizer that we put on fields, plants actually, they use less than 40% of that. As I said earlier, that, that nitrate is very easily dissolved, and it ends up in water bodies such as rivers, lakes, and oceans. So is this a problem? And the answer is yes, it is. So this is a, an example of a, a stream at the edge of a farmer's field. And the farmer will be using fertilizer to get that maximum yield from their crop. But as I said, the plant... Plants are not using most of that nitrogen, they're not using that fertilizer, and it finds its ways into water uh, bodies such as this brook. Now, the algae um, contained here absolutely love this fertilizer. This source of nitrate is, um, they, they use it to very quickly uh, grow and reproduce, and you get what you see here uh, that we call an algal bloom. So why in itself this isn't uh, the, the actual problem? It's, it's when that algae die, the bacteria use up that algae, and they, they eat it themselves, and in doing that, they use oxygen, and that depletes that water source of oxygen. And ultimately, it leads to ecosystem collapse. Everything in this brook dies. Now, one very good but very sad example of this eutrophication is the Mississippi Delta dead zone. This is a map um, of uh, North America, of uh, USA. And you can see the Mississippi River starting here in Minnesota, and it winds its way down uh, past um, Iowa and Illinois, down to um, Louisiana, where it comes out in the Gulf of Mexico. But it's not water that just comes down the Mississippi. It's water as far as in Montana, where streams run down and they run into the Mississippi, then down out into the Gulf of Mexico. So the problem is that farmers right the way up in Montana are using fertilizer on their fields. Most of this fertilizer, this nitrate, doesn't find its way into plants. It ends up in these rivers. These drain into the Mississippi, and it drains down to the Gulf of Mexico. And the same is true for farmers over here in the Ohio River Basin, the same is true for farmers in Arkansas in the, the White River Basin here and the Red River Basin here. So what we have is a very high buildup of nitrate here in the Gulf of Mexico, and this is what's known as the Mississippi Delta dead zone. So this is a heat map, and the, the red coloration shows a very high level of nitrate. This is where the, the Mississippi... Um, comes at the end into the Gulf of Mexico, and you can see it's surrounded by a very high level of nitrate. And this gives rise to what we know as the dead zone you can see here on the left-hand side, and I guess a, a normal or a live zone on the right-hand side here. So it's the obvious um, environmental problems here, so everything dies here, everything that can't move over to this side. It also has a a commercial impact on fishermen and fishermen that are using this um, to bring in their uh, uh, fish and shrimps and other things that they catch here. So it's environmentally and commercially damaging. And it's not just restricted to the Gulf of Mexico. So the red dots here show the spots where we have uh, low levels of oxygen due to eutrophication. And you can see that we're surrounded by that in Europe and then parts of Asia also. So it's a global problem. As well as the environmental damage, fertilizers are very expensive. And this just shows over the last few years or so that the price is rising um, of fertilizer. Now, why this is 
some farmers, say in Europe, might be able to tolerate this, farmers in many African countries simply can't afford to use fertilizer. And the world's population is continuing to grow. So back in 1804, it was 1 billion. Right now, we're looking at just over 7 billion. And by 2050, we're looking at more than 9 billion. So the problem is nitrate addition to crops leads to higher yields, but it's expensive and harmful to the environment. And on top of this, we have an increasing world population which is demanding even higher crop yields. So we need to improve the crop yields to feed the expanding population, but we can't do it with fertilizer. I've shown you it's incredibly damaging to the environment. Okay, so I'm now going to show you how we're using science to try and solve this problem. So in the lab, we work with a plant uh, called Medicargo truncatula, and it's got a very couple of cool tricks up its sleeve. So it's able to form relationships with at least two microbes in the soil, one of which is the bacterium, Cinerhizobium melaloti, and the other is Glomus interradices. This is a fungus. And in uh, both of these cases, the microbe provides a plant with a source of nutrients that it couldn't reliably obtain on its own. So in the case of the bacterium, this supplies the plant with a usable source of nitrogen. So this plant metacargo, it doesn't need fertilizer. It's teamed up with this bacterium that feeds it its own nitrogen. It's incredible. But also, it gets a source of phosphorus uh, from a fungus. Now, in return for these goodies, the plant provides the microbes with sugar that it gets from photosynthesis. Now, this bacterial symbiosis, the nutrients are exchanged in something called a root nodule. These are on the roots of the plant. You can see the uh, bumps here, the pink bumps. And for the fungal uh, symbiosis, But actually, around 90% of land plants, and that includes cereals, are able to partake in this symbiosis to get a source of phosphorus. So scientists in the lab, we're trying to look and understand this process uh, where the plant can get its own source of nitrogen. And what we're trying to ask is, is can we persuade cereals that currently can't do this can we persuade them to team up with the bacterium to get to the back with the bacteria to get their own source of nitrogen so we don't have to use um, as much fertilizer, if any? So at this point, I just want to send around an example. This is a Medicargo plant that we have uh, in the lab. And uh, you can see the nodules are, are just below the tape. I just want you to have a quick look at that. And as I said earlier, these nodules, this is where the nutrients is taking place. So the bacteria are inside these nodules. They're providing the plant with nitrogen, and the plant is providing the bacteria with sugar. Cheers. It's kind of dark, but you can just about see those nodules if you look on the root just below the tape. So this is something like a worldwide equivalent of 40 megatons of nitrate per year. So a lot of nitrogen is being produced uh, for the plant in this system. So over the last 20 years or so, scientists have been working intensely and trying to understand how this happens. And it starts off with something that we call a molecular dialogue. So the plants, they exude a compound known as flavonoids into the soil 
these flavonoids are recognized by the bacteria. And if the bacteria like those flavonoids that are on offer, then they synthesize something that we call nod factor or nodulation factor. And in a similar manner, if the plant likes that nod factor that's on offer, then it'll initiate a program um, to accommodate that microbe. So this is basically the two organisms just checking their credentials, seeing if they're going to get on, and seeing if that symbiosis is going to be successful. If they decide that they like each other, then the bacteria will stick to the root hairs of the plant. The plant root hairs will then start to curl around the bacteria, kind of grabbing them tightly. And this is what you can see here on the left. This is known as an infection focus. And the blue coloration is staining of the bacteria. So the root hairs have curled around those bacteria, and they've grabbed them tightly. It's a remarkable process that you'd never really imagine. Shortly after that, the plant starts to build a tunnel that bores down the length of the root hair right the way into the center of the root where the nodule is formed and the nutrients are exchanged. And this provides a safe passage for the bacteria to divide and slide down the length of this tunnel um, to where the nodule will be formed. And then this is just a, a time point a little bit later on. You can see where the tunnel is formed down into the middle, into the cortex of the root, and you can see that the root is now starting to curve to make these nodule-like, these are nodule structures. So we really need to understand the mole molecular mechanism of this process. And we've got a pretty good idea now, over the last 20 years, um, we've figured a lot of this out. And this is a, a very basic path I'm going to show here. It's a much more complicated, actually, but this is, uh, will give you a good understanding of the basics. So as I said earlier, the rhizobia secrete the nod factor. The plant then recognizes the nod factor using nod factor receptors. This then triggers something called calcium spiking. So calcium within the root hair cells goes from a low concentration to high, to low, to high, to low, to high. And it's shown by these pictures, with the red and white coloration being the highest level. And we can video this. So you can see the calcium concentration pulsating, going from high to low, from high to low. So that's in response to the presence of the bacteria. A protein that we call a decoder perceives this calcium spiking signal, and then it activates um, many other proteins, including these, NIN and ERN, which eventually lead to the initiation of the nodules. So researchers have also been looking at the fungal symbiosis. Remember, this is present in cereals, in rice, wheat, and maize. And if we look at the molecular pathway required to accommodate the fungus, you'll see it's actually very similar. So the fungi make something called MYC factor. This is recognized by a receptor. This then leads to calcium spiking. It's perceived by this decoder, and this ultimately um, results in the fungus entering the plant. So you can see that many of the components here are shared between the two symbioses. So in other words, cereal crops actually have all this machinery shown in green. So the task in the lab is to engineer the receptor so the cereal crop could recognize the bacteria, and then these downstream activators um, to allow the bacteria to enter and to produce these nodules. So the cereals already have this common machinery. So just to reiterate, what we're trying to do is to make a cereal crop, such as maize, um, fix nitrogen um, using the uh, nodule system shown here. 
So the first thing that we've got underway in the lab is that we're putting the nod factor receptor, the ability to recognize the symbiotic bacteria um, into the cereal crop. And then what we'll do is we'll look for the ability of that cereal crop uh, to calcium spike. Can it recognize, can it use that receptor to recognize the bacteria? And then if this is successful, we'll then add in the other downstream activators and we'll look for the presence um, of these nodules. So briefly, the applications and implications of this technology. This will improve crop yields of wheat, maize, or rice without the need for using fertilizer. And this will stop environmental damage due to fertilizer use. But just as importantly is that it will make uh, it much, things much more um, affordable uh, for farmers in countries um, in Africa. And this is the, the topic of a large grant um, that we have in the lab, and it's entitled Engineering Nitrogen Symbiosis for Africa. This is led by Professor Giles Aldroyd. And this is uh, within its first five years, and we're really investigating um, the feasibility of doing this. This is a very ambitious project. It's something that might take 20 or 30 years to make a crop, that, a cereal crop that's able to fix its own nitrogen. So we're in the very early stages and we're looking, um, is this feasible? Can we transfer these nodulation genes into cereal crops? And I'd encourage you to check out um, our website here. So just to summarize what I've said today, to feed 9 billion people, we will need to improve crop yields without using environmentally damaging and, and expensive fertilizers. And legumes form a symbiosis with nitrogen-fixing bacteria to provide additional nitrate. And engineering nitrogen-fixing cereals will allow farmers to increase yields without using expensive and environmentally damaging fertilizer. So I just want to say thanks for listening, and if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.